once around Eta Carina. So Eta Carina is a star in the Southern Hemisphere, which I'm sure some of you will be pleased to hear since there have been a number of requests for such an object. And I chose this one because it's an absolutely fascinating beast. So where is it? Well, it's in the constellation of Carina, and it's a fairly modest looking star to the naked eye. And uh, you can find it using the star map that we've got here. It's ringed in red over in amongst all those star fields that down um, around getting on for 60 degrees declination south, so minus 60. This means that you can't see it from a lot of the northern hemisphere. You have to be south of 30 degrees north around about the latitude of Cairo in order to see it at all. But if you're well into the southern hemisphere, if you're below 30 degrees south, then you will see it all the time. It'll be circumpolar around the south southern pole. It lies within a very large dusty nebula. This is the Carina Nebula, which you can see in the image here, first spotted from the Cape of Good Hope by astronomers in 1752. The southern sky wasn't really explored very well until then. And in addition to all that gas and dust and a lot of very hot young stars, you've got the Carina OB1 Association. Uh, an OB1 Association is uh, a collection of O and B class stars, the biggest type of main sequence stars, the uh, blue hot giant stars. And there's a number of star clusters, open clusters. You can see one to the middle left there, and there's another one to the uh, middle right of the image. And several very, very powerful stars, the Wolf Rayet stars. Wolf Rayet stars are so powerful and so massive, they tend to blow away all of their outer envelope, depleting them of hydrogen so that their spectrum looks very peculiar. You see the inner helium that's already built inside a shell. So one of those clusters is Trumpler 16, a very young cluster, under a million years old. This entire area is full of newly made stars built out of all this gas and dust that has been getting together and collapsing under its gravity. And one of the stars that you can see there is WR25, a Wolf Rayet star, 100 times the mass of our sun, 2 million times the power output, and with a surface temperature of 50,000 degrees. So a lot of the light that's coming out, you can't see because it's in the ultraviolet. Um, it's gone way beyond blue hot. It's now UV hot and uh, a very, very short-lived but powerful star. And, of course, Eta Carina itself, which we'll talk about in more detail, and that's even more powerful, four million times the total power output of the sun. Now, this uh, area was imaged by the good plane, James Webb Space Telescope and produced this Cosmic Cliffs image, which is absolutely fantastic. Let's bring it up a bit larger. Uh, it's just awesome showing all that gas and dust and all of the uh, stars in and around that have been manufactured by it. It's just an amazing photograph. But if you zoom right in on Eta Carina, you find this strange double-lobed uh, affair where a, a giant eruption of material has taken place and blown these two spheres down the polar axis of uh, a, an amazing amount of material that's been ejected from the star in the center there. And we've got an uh, infrared image of that central region zoomed right in where you can see the very bright object deep in the center of the uh, expanding cloud of material. Now we can look at it in other wavelengths. So the left-hand picture is ultraviolet, again showing that structure and an earlier ring of material that appears to have resulted perhaps from an earlier outpouring of material. And then we've got an x-ray picture showing just how there are some very high temperature is going on in the uh, cloud and in the star right in the center there. 
because we're getting these very powerful high energy x-rays from it now deep in the center very hard to see what's going on but we think there are two stars there we're reasonably sure that it's a double star system in a fairly long thin elliptical orbit arrangement and uh, originally it was estimated it was going around a, about 5.5 years for the period of these two stars but as i say we can't quite see the stars themselves it would be superb if we could because if you can see two stars orbiting around their common center of mass like this you can learn a lot you can find out what the masses of the two stars are accurately and do all kinds of other um, calculations but what we believe at this point is that the larger star eta carina a is so massive it probably is a luminous blue variable um, began with more than 200 somewhere between 150 and 250 times the mass of the sun and is probably lost by these periods of ejection of material and it's extremely powerful solar wind 30 times the mass of the sun has already been ejected from it in quite an incredibly violent situation and that violence is likely to continue because we think it's going to blow up as a supernova and this is astronomically speaking soon the star really at this sort of mass won't live very long at all we think that the life cycle of such a beast is probably only three million years. And, the, you know, it's probably started at least a million years ago. So astronomically speaking, it's only got around two million years left before it will come to the violent end as a supernova. So you can see this graphic showing how it uh, grows from fusing hydrogen to helium and then helium to carbon, and then ends up building the other elements into an onion structure with a, an iron core, and then uh, it collapses in the core down, and we think that such massive stars may well collapse down to a black hole. The exact outcome of this depends on its mass and on uh, how much of the heavy elements there are already present in the envelope and it might well be affected by all of the material around it and the uh, presence of its companion, the B star, as well. Now, it's far enough away. It's about 7,500 light years away. So that a supernova at that distance would be fairly spectacular. It would light up the sky a bit like Venus does at about magnitude minus four, perhaps, um, and be easily visible for a while for the requisite 100 days or so while it uh, dissipates but probably wouldn't cause too many bad effects on earth although this one could be a particularly violent one especially with the interaction with the enormous amount of material that it's already ejected and might really be classified as a potential hypernova even larger than a classic core collapse supernova and then if that were the case it might interfere with some of our satellite communications and perhaps do some damage to the ozone layer but we don't really expect the damage to be significant now you can also see on the diagram the enormous jet coming out of the black hole along the spin axis in the graphic um, and we are sure that the spin axis does not point at earth so any such jets or gamma ray bursts uh, caused when this thing blows up will not be coming our way its companion star the small star is still somewhere in the range 30 to 80 solar masses this is still a whopper in its own right and an o type star classed as one of the largest groups of stars of all um, and it too will live for less than 10 million years before it too explodes as a supernova left to its own devices but the interaction with its companion may well doom it sooner than that uh, so a short and violent life and speaking of the violence in the system back in 1837 what really got everybody's attention was that Eta Carina suddenly brightened right up 
from obscurity up to um, being one of the brightest stars in the sky. It went from magnitude four, so visible but not spectacular, to being brighter than Rigel in Orion, which is a magnitude zero star. And so that was uh, very powerful indeed. And the light curve is shown on the right-hand side here with the enormously high peak for all those measurements. But then it declined back down again. And by uh, 1843, um, it was at its peak and dropped by 1856 to below naked eye visibility. So uh, you couldn't see it at all at that stage. But then in 1892, it came back to being visible just at magnitude six because there was a second smaller outburst, again shown as that second little peak on the light curve there. Now, interestingly, we think that these outbursts and the e ejecting of so much mass out into the nebula has affected the orbit. So the latest estimates of the orbit are that it's now reduced down to more like uh, four years rather than the five and a half caused by the positions of the stars moving through and the influence of frictional drag on their motion as it's going through all the material that's been ejected from the star. So there's definite possibilities that these two will spiral together if this sort of process continues. And it's doing it again because since about 1940, it's been getting brighter, and you can see part of the light curve here. It's uh, coming up to around magnitude four now, having been just on the verge of naked eye visibility in 1940. And the brightening's just uh, continuing in a slightly erratic manner, but it's uh, definitely showing signs that uh, there's activity there. Now, when we look at the spectrum of this object, it's most peculiar, probably because what we're really seeing is the emission lines from all the material in the nebula, in the cloud of gas around it. So the radiation coming from these hot stars is lighting up the cloud of gas, as shown by that Hubble image on the left, taken with the Wide Field Planetary Camera Mark II. And it's producing these emission lines of helium, nickel, iron, argon, and so forth that uh, make the spectrum of this object most peculiar. And it varies. Uh, and again, that's a sign that this is the turbulence and the expansion of the cloud of material uh, powered by the enormous stellar winds coming off the giant stars in the centre. And another effect that was of interest, we've got an animation of it on the right here, is how you can actually track visible changes. So what we can see here is looks like a lot of material moving across away from the uh, central region. But this isn't moving of material. This is uh, a light echo. It's the reflection of a pulse of light. So suddenly the central region brightened for a short period of time and the direct line of sight light came straight to us and arrived first and then light that had taken a different route and reflected back to us off regions of the cloud where the combined light travel time of the diagonal routes was longer arrives afterwards and so whilst this looks like it's moving it's the outward traveling camera flash this is why you shouldn't use a flash to take pictures of things unless they're really close because the uh, flash from distant objects will take time to reflect back to you and here it's bit the camera flash was set off when there was an outburst of the star 7500 light years away and this overall cloud of material is light years wide and so the longer path can be really quite severely delayed. We've seen this in a number of other objects. Now, we thought that uh, Eta Carina was very, very peculiar. Um, it certainly is in our Milky Way, but we have been tracking down a number of similar objects that may well be doing the same thing with these massive stars embedded in these outpouring nebulae 
um, in other galaxies. So we've I've been looking at uh, M83, M101, the pinwheel, M51, the Whirlpool galaxy, and so on, the, and finding similar structures. So maybe it's not as unusual as all of that, in that it does seem to occur, well, at least at, at half a dozen times in uh, visible range. So I'll end with this fantastic picture of what's called the homunculus nebula surrounding Eta Carina, the enormous outpouring of material um, as if it's desperately trying to explode, but just hasn't quite got there yet. And I hope you've enjoyed that one. Thanks a lot.